over the last several weeks as a church, we've been talking about kind of bad theology, and we're going to wrap it up uh, today. Next week, we're starting the book of Jonah. I'm going to look at some principles in, in the book. And um, as we wrap up today, kind of the the idea of bad theology, and maybe it's not quite as bad theology, but sometimes it is this concept in our minds as we're chasing after the perfect church, right? After the perfect church. And it seems like that there's always, the grass always looks greener on the other side, right? My very first church that I got to uh, be a youth pastor in South Africa, I was in, uh, uh, was helping a friend to plant a church and we were in a hair salon, right? I had zero budget, no money. I didn't even make any money. And we're in this hair salon and I've got some friends that graduated with me and they're in some of the bigger churches in, in town. And so and here I am, I have zero money money, zero budget, and we're trying to do our best, doing youth ministry. And these poor guys had to constantly, it's like, okay, Stephen, we'll just take you out for lunch, right? We know you can't afford that. And I was like, okay. And at least from my perspective, seeing um, the facilities that they had, the programming that they had, they're like, that is the perfect church. And then, you know, Later on, started in a different church in, in South Africa and a little bigger, again, zero budget. And the kids, it was just, it was wonderful. And then God started calling us to America, you know, and you get an image of the American church when you're in South Africa. It looks all perfect, right? Because you only see the mega churches and the big bands and, and different things. And so you're like, well, if I end up in America, then that's going to be the perfect church. And then you start in this, and we ended up in Fairmont, Minnesota. It wasn't a mega church, right? Small farming community and beautiful. But it was interesting. My, at least my first three, four months, looking back, longing for South Africa and the youth group. It was like, well, I thought it was going to look way different. And now they have snow and all these other different things. It's like, man, how I long for, for South Africa. And in our mind, even during COVID, there's always, you know, there were so many different things that was going on in our churches. And there's always a temptation. And there is a time, you know, we all go through seasons where the Lord might call us out to a different area over a different church. Um, but there is, unfortunately, such a culture to, to hop around to different churches and not to really be planted where God is calling us to be. Um, this, uh, several weeks ago, we had the opportunity to travel to uh, Colorado Springs and we made it through to, um, what is that, Rock, Col Rock, Castle Rock. We were driving through Castle Lo Rock and there was this beautiful rainbow. And Vanessa got so excited about the rainbow and instead of said, look, look for the, watch the rainbow, she said, uh, there is the pot of gold. Right. And we're all like, hey, where's that pot of gold? Well, we all know that there's no pot of gold under the rainbow. They had all these signs of Bigfoot out in Colorado, like different areas. It's like everyone's looking for Bigfoot. There is no Bigfoot, right? There's the Loch Ness Monster, you know, you can try and go to Scotland and, and try and find it. In the same way, at least in our minds, what we think about the perfect church, it doesn't exist. It was interesting. There's a, um, an article by Tom Rainier. He is a well-known um, church leader, and he works a lot of times with churches that are in trouble, that's dealing with conflict, and then he brings leadership to them. And he asked on, on X, Twitter, um, for churches, some of the things that they have seen that have created conflict in the church. And so there's kind of 25 things that he shares. I'm not going to do all 25, but here's just some of the things that created conflict. Uh, argument over the appropriate length of the worship pastor's beard. Uh, I can see that. It might be beard and hair. Um, a church dispute of whether or not to install restroom stall dividers in the women's restroom, all right? A big church, 
uh, argumented over the discovery that the church budget was off with 10 cents. Major conflict when the youth borrowed a crock pot that had not been used for years. And it's like you read through these 25 things, it's like, are we serious? Is this the stuff that can cause conflict in the church, right? But we often dream of the perfect church. We see it as a place without flaws, filled with perfect people and without any conflict or shortcomings. Now, at least in our mind, our definition of the perfect church are dominated by things like a pastor that preaches appealing and practical sermons. Yeah, good luck. Worship music that stirs us, presentations that are flawless, programs that address our life needs, and well-kept facilities. Again, good luck. Our properties, guys, they just work 15 minutes and then they eat donuts. So, <laughs> just kidding. Where's Derek? Uh, D. All right. It is easy to kind of drool. Sometimes we have this image of the perfect church in the New Testament, the early church. And, you know, a lot of times when we read those things, like, man, that was such a great time. But it's easy to forget that they had issues as well. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians. But just to give you context, this was a church um, that Paul, Paul was the church planter. He's the one that created this church. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I would love to have Paul as my pastor, right? That would have been pretty sweet. And you would think that he knew how to deal with all of these details. This would be the perfect church. And he spent about a year and a half with this church. And so he now he left and now he's getting word that there's some issues in his church. And so this is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll read it for us. It says, I, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no division amongst you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. You. So this is this is Paul's church, and it says that he appeals, that some translation says that he begs them to say, hey, let's get this, let's get our act together, right? And it says there is division the among you, kind of the Greek talks about that it's ripping them apart. The stuff that they're saying and the stuff that they're doing is actually ripping them apart. Apart. And so suddenly we don't have this image of the perfect church, even with Paul's church, like they are dealing with some things. And he's saying, hey, let us be united in mind and in thought. And again, the, the Greek here, he is referring to a medical term. And the image that he's trying to communicate to them is to say it's almost like a broken uh, an arm. It's like it is not meant to be broken it is meant to be united when that thing is broken it is painful and so he's saying hey what is happening amongst you you guys are divided you are tearing each other apart it is like a broken arm and this is not good you guys gotta figure this out even in acts chapter 15 if you have your bible with you acts chapter 15 give you one more example and just reading uh, verse, starting in verse 35, but Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch where they and many others stood and preached the word of the Lord. So first of all, it is going well. When you read this whole chapter, you, you're hearing about the different miracles and the stories that is happening. They are having a very successful ministry. But then verse 36, it continues. It some sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John also called Mark with them, but Paul did not think it was wise. So now they're kind of disagreeing, disagreeing about who they're going to take with them on this mission team. Verse 39, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. 
Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And then, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. Here is just, it was fascinating when you read through those chapters, the dynamic team that they are. And suddenly there is such a sharp disagreement within them that they're going in different directions. And we see it in, in church today. It's just like, man, there is no such thing as a perfect church. And the reason is because you're a member of it. And I'm a member. As soon as you started to go to that church, guess what? Now it's not perfect anymore. <laughs> because you brought all of your mess and things with it and I'm right there with you. I, I, I like this. It's a perfect church who'd have no need for grace, forgiveness or compassion. But in our imperfections, we find opportunities to embody Christ's love. Now, this message really started about two weeks ago for me. I was uh, um, really discouraged one week or about two weeks ago. I saw the, the um, message from Tony Evans. Maybe you saw that as well, where he kind of, he, he um, I don't know that he resigned, but he took some time off from his church. He said that there is some, and you know who Tony Evans, really well-known pastor from Texas. Um, his daughter is Priscilla. Is it Priscilla? What's her last name? Sh Schreier. Right. And so uh, Tony Evans, a big, big church, been faithful 40, 48 years. And um, he had to step down and kind of the message to the congregation is being like, hey, I didn't do anything illegal, but he has fallen short on the expectation that whatever that might be, we don't know. And in that same week, you maybe saw the, the news about Robert Morris, Pastor Robert Morris, another mega, mega church, I also think in, in Texas, and uh, some things that happened when he was 21 years in ministry and things that kind of came out now, and he resigned. And so I'm just like discouraged because I watch all of these guys. And when we think about over the years on how many people, have dropped the ball in church. It is really sad because it impacts the kingdom of God. And just to really realize again this morning that first of all, there's no perfect pastor. Can I hear amen? And there's no perfect church. As soon as we put our eyes on people, we will be disappointed. Nobody is perfect walking this earth other than Jesus when he was walking this earth, right? And so pastors and people will always will fail us. And especially when we're vulnerable, when we open up our hearts, when we start to build relationships and we trust people and then people disappoint us, right? It is hard. It impacts us deeply. But guess what? That is life unless you maybe go to church on a Sunday morning and you just go la 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 you're not talking to anybody right and you leave immediately after that then maybe you will not be impacted but as soon as we start to have relationships with people and you notice even just in your own family right we don't even have to go to to churches just think about the the messiness in your own family sometimes as well and so just listening through all of that, I was reminded just of God's grace. And, and, and it was like Jesus was telling me in that week because I was really discouraged and just I felt like my energy was just drained and I was almost not even, um, uh, didn't want to go into church that day. And it just, it really hit me. And God just reminded me that message like, Stephen, that is why you, why we, why you need a savior. That's why I died on the cross. It's like there is nobody perfect. It's only Jesus Christ. And even in Luke chapter 6, Jesus reminds us, he says, And Jesus answering said unto them, so he's talking to the Pharisees, he says, That they are whole, uh, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to 
repentance. And so when we think about church life and the churches that we are going back to this, uh, you know, after today, it is a hospital for the sick. And we can't put this expectation on our churches to say, hey, every program, every message, everything needs to be perfect because a lot of times we then make it about ourselves and it is not about us, right? Amen. Uh, it is about what Jesus Christ did for us and we get to take that message of hope and that word of encouragement to the world, to the hurt, to the needy. Our churches should be full of people that are in desperate need of Jesus Christ. And guess what? That starts with the pastor. That starts with me. Because if you know my life, you know that I am desperate. I am so desperate for Jesus Christ constantly because I am flawed. And there's so many areas in my life where I just need Jesus, right? And I am grateful that I can go to a church that will encourage me in that walk and uh, that I can be a pastor and encourage our congregation and encourage you this morning as well. There is um, a warning for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 12. It says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. The church should never be a place where we feel so um, self-righteous in a sense and think, oh, I have arrived. There's no issues in my life because it is those moments that we just might fall, right? And so it's always about coming humbly to the Lord and on a Sunday morning and say, man, I have not arrived. I am, uh, I just, I got to continue to uh, keep growing in my faith and our journey of faith in the church is marked by growth repentance and reliance on god's grace not by achieving perfection there's a, a latin phrase um, that Mart, uh, martin luther coined uh, i'm going to try not butcher it but i totally agree with this and i think we see that in the book of romans it is sumul lustis uh, et pecat, uh, pecator, okay? Uh, if you're better than me in Latin, I apologize if I butchered that. But here's what it means. Simultaneously righteous and a sinner. And so there is this working of God in our lives where we are sinners, right? As long as we're on this side of heaven, in the flesh, we will deal with with sin nobody sitting here today can actually say hey you are perfect we all deal with stuff but on the other end of it because of what christ done on the cross for us we are also um, righteous right and we are judge uh, uh, just in front of god as well and so you have this tension of like yeah walking on this earth we have um challenges we have sin but on the other end God's mercy and his grace and what he's done on the cross for us is working in our favor. And we're also righteous and we are um, judge, uh, judge. So that is uh, uh, amazing. And just again, I think when we read the book of Romans, that all becomes very clear for us. So I want you to know, just as we think about our churches, ministry is messy because it involves real people with real struggles. But it is in the mess that God's redemptive power is most evident. We see lives transformed not because of our perfection, but because of God's mercy and grace, right? And so that is wonderful that in, uh, in the midst of all of our challenges, our brokenness, the things that we bring every Sunday morning to church, right? That God is not looking for a perfect church, but he wants us in those moments to rely on His grace. He wants us to re rely on the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in those moments. And so as a church this morning, I want to just encourage you, keep your eye on the ball. This past week, I had opportunity to go and play golf for the first time this summer, and it was rough. Uh, it wasn't good. I enjoyed the fellowship and the person that I went with. And uh, there's just constantly that temptation. You're supposed to keep your eye on the ball. And it's like, man, I'm just looking everywhere, right? And you could see that in my drive. It wasn't very good. And so this morning for us to say, as we look at our churches, don't look for the flaws. Keep your eye on the mission 
of your church. If you're part of South, or if you're part of Salem Covenant Church, our mission is to encounter God, equip people, extend the gospel. This mission calls us to action and not perfection. We are to be vessels through which God's love and truth are shared with the world. So God does give us um, some information on what it means to be that perfect church. And we can be that perfect church when we do the stuff that God is telling us. And so just I'm going to close with, with these two verses. First one is Colossians chapter 3. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, that's you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ sitting here this morning, you are his chosen people. Holy and dear loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then Romans 12, uh, verse 9 to 13, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. If we do all those things, if that's our focus, man, we're going to have amazing churches and amazing experiences. In closing, I want to remind you that God's love for us is not based on our perfection our heavenly father knows our weaknesses our flaws and our brokenness and yet he chooses to work through us the beauty of the gospel is that god meets us exactly where we are are at in the midst of our struggles and imperfections may we leave here today with hearts full of hope knowing that god's work is in us is ongoing He's faithful and he will complete the good work he has begun. Let's embrace our journey uh, of imperfections and all with the assurance that God is with us, for us and working through us.